Here's the game as a cyber risk management subject matter expert. He's got different verticals from the health industries, private companies, education, and he'll be speaking to you. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Hernandez. Thank you. Forgot financial services at the time, <laughs> which is basically what the talk is about today. Uh, any lawyers in the room? Really? Okay. Awesome. Uh, so we have a disclaimer, right? Uh, you know, I won't go into the fine print of reading each and everything that you see on the screen, but ultimately, uh, most importantly, my thoughts are solely my own uh, and not represent any of those here, in, you know, as far as representing our employers from present and yesteryear, and of course, these sites, right? And obviously, I'm not a lawyer, like I mentioned, nor did I sleep at a holiday. Yesterday. So, you know. So some regulatory history from the historical perspective on com compliance and regulations. We have the Star Starbase Oxy Act. Obviously, we all know how that one came about uh, with the financial situation there in 2001 with Enron and you know a lot of the bad uh, business things happening at that point in time. And then obviously in October 2011, the SEC came up with the Division of Corporate Financing publishing some uh, disclosure topics and regulatory uh, you know, statutes. And then obviously in the February 2018, the commission uh, on statement on guidance of public security disclosures kind of came about and the sport we stand today, right? To talk about materiality, cybersecurity risk, reporting those in the time of flashing, warnings around trade, trade and cybersecurity incidents are happening, and then materiality, which we're gonna get into and discuss in depth. That's more the historical perspective. So NYDFS, right? Um, NYDFS is the New York Financial Department of Services for Cybersecurity Regulatory uh, Enhancement and Oversight. Uh, it's called 23NYCRR Part 500. Um, basically, you know, this law has been enacted, has been in place uh, for a few years now. They just really made their last changes for the Second Amendment this past year in November. Uh, basically, the main takeaways, as you're reading everything on the screen, is focusing on incident response, Doubling down on incident response from that perspective. Uh, gap assessments in all the areas that are covered, right? They run from 500.1 all the way to 500.16, 17, all the areas uh, in that. So I won't, you know, this won't be a smooth test to actually deep dive into the regulation because uh, I don't want everyone to fall asleep with it, uh, on this topic, but at the same time, it's good to know the regulation and understand the areas that it covers. Um, basically, the new requirements on certification is all about risk assessment. The NYD has called a risk assessment the hardened driver. So what does that tell you? Like if the regulatory agency is telling you that it's the hardened driver, you might want to you know put you know put attention to that and use that. And that actually drives the regulatory uh, cadence, right? Normally cadence are yearly or annually. Now it's based on any material changes on your risk assessment and your risk profile. So keep that in mind. The SEC, right? The SEC materiality rule that's been that's been uh, top of mind for a lot of folks. Um, basically started uh, in the Depression years in 1933, uh, passed in the Security Exchange Act of 1934. Two main purposes, right? Uh, you know, public must tell the truth about the business, uh, the securities that they're selling, the risk involved. Obviously, you know, you, you'll see that a big uh, iterative approach on this is being honest, being transparent, talking to the truth, right? Uh, those who sell in trade securities, brokers, dealers, and exchanges must treat investors fairly and honestly. It's all about protecting the end user, the investor, especially the publicly traded out there. That's basically the main thing of the SEC. So the new SEC cybersecurity rule took effect in 2023. Um, you know, basically the big one about this one is disclosing materiality disclosures four days after the business has determined that there's a material cybersecurity incident or event happening. Uh, you know, the, the changes happened in September 4, 2023, so they're actually happening now. Uh, and well, as we go through the presentation, I mean, I just got you know some news that happened two days ago, which is really interesting, but at the same time, it's not surprising, right? Based on the SEC materiality rule, uh, you have to report those in your 8Ks, and you're familiar with 8K forms, 10K forms, based on you know the processes, identification of risk, everything that's happening from a cybersecurity perspective. They're written, you know, from the SEC perspective to report those in the four-day threshold that they have to report, right? So describing the management role in assessing the, the risk and managing those cybersecurity risks, it ultimately falls down on leadership, right? So there's got to be accountability on the leadership from the top down to make sure that there's insight into the cybersecurity plan, the program, how that's being enforced, how that's being adjudicated, how controls are actually helping you reduce risk, burn down risk in your organization to ultimately, like I mentioned, protect the investor, protect the end user. Um, as actually, the mandates are not new. They've been around for a long time. You know, uh, 
Disclosure materiality security incidents have been around for a long time. Uh, obviously, we heard of GDPR, the 72 hour uh, rule for notification, HIPAA, those in healthcare, right? Probably no HIPAA in and out, high tech. Uh, PCI DSS with the new PCI DSS uh, you know, uh, you know, regulation that's coming out. Uh, a lot of people are getting prepped for that, right? I think a big, a big new driver of PCI DSS is risk assessment as well. You know, surprise, right? I mean, they want to really, uh, you know, double down on risk assessment and having really good regulatory, uh, you know, compliance oversight for your controls and tie those into PCI DSS protecting cargo data and all those different things, right? And then Circia, uh, the government's really getting involved and doubling down and helping with private sector and working together to help them uh, reduce uh, risk. Obviously, they're seeing a little bit more from the infrastructure, critical infrastructure, water, oil, and gas. But you know that's a mandate from the government talking to you know three three business days to report those incidents from a critical infrastructure and partnership perspective, right? The new SEC rules require registered public companies, both U.S. and foreign, uh, to disclose these described risk management practices, like I mentioned, within the four days uh, in your 8K. So that's a really important thing to keep note of. Uh, and ultimately, you know, there's a lot more, you know, uh, fires right that are happening based on the regulatory rules that are in place. Uh, ultimately, it comes down to materiality, right? Uh, and materiality is meant to be, you know, per uh, perceived in different lights. Uh, by nature, the regulatory mandates on um, what materiality actually means is vague by nature, right? So you have to be cognizant of that. Uh, if you ask, if you ask what materiality is, too many times you're probably doing it wrong, right? You're probably not having the right approach. Uh, information is material if there's a substantial likelihood that a recent rule shareholder would consider it important in making an investment decision or it would have significantly altered the total mix of information made available, right? It's also important to know that a series of individual imma immaterial, imma immature or immaterial items, if you kind of snowball them and bring them together, it's considered material, right? So, you know, you, wanna pe you don't want to piecemeal different threats and different vulnerabilities because ultimately they might come back and compound and make a material incident. So compliance CYA uh, and regulatory cover your basis, right? Uh, obviously adapt. Adapting, you know, and identify the root cause when you're doing, uh, you know, I've been, I, I, I've been a cybersecurity auditor for a major financial organization, global financial organization, and obviously you want to look at the root cause, right? When you look at your uh, your assessments, your controls, planning and managing those operations. So it's basically adapting, anticipating, protecting, responding, right? So, you know, basically the main one, the main takeaway from this slide is assessing the materiality recovery time objectives from an interim response. I mentioned that was probably the biggest driver for the uh, NYDFS and SEC, uh, you know, cybersecurity disclosure rules. And then patch the vulnerabilities, right? Not patch all the things, because it's basically impossible to patch all things, but you get the you get you get the gist of it, right? You understand that based on the criticality, uh, and ultimately, you know, I'm not really talking about it here, but how do you drive what needs to be patched? You need to have an accurate asset inventory, right? And ultimately, that's a pain point for a lot of people, right? Uh, to understand what assets are out there, kind of like the glazier, you know, you see everything that's on top, but you don't see anything that's on the bottom. APIs for all, technology for all, and then obviously, in shadow, shadow IT is a big deal, and it happens. Uh, and I've been in I've been in organizations where you know people go around the normal procurement processes, right, to acquire technology, and that introduces a lot of risk and, and danger to an organization. Uh, any questions on this slide? This one's a big one, right? Adapting, protecting, responding, uh, you know, and understanding that assessing and materiality comes from all those different functions that you're doing for sector. Where do you start on this wheel? Where do you start on the wheel? I mean, uh, that's a great question. Uh, I mean, literally, uh, I, I think uh, asset inventory is probably the, the way that you want to start to understand what you have in your environment, what you can, what's crown yield, what's what's important for the organization, and then take it from there. So that's a, you know, I, I know it's a lot to take in, but yeah, you have to start somewhere. That's a great question. Thank you. So I had a shed, uh, shed a tear moment from the 2023 uh, Texas Cyber Summit that happened last year in Austin. Uh, so you know, the most hacker person you can see, you know, like hoodie and black hat and stickers and you know they go to DEFCON, they go to all the all the different security conferences you can talk and you know red team hundred percent you know offensive person right and he was given a presentation and he was talking about SIM, SOAR, EDR, XDR, CrowdStrike, everything that they're working with. But then he started talking about a risk register and I'm like I just started I just kinda I perked up when he said that and you know a little tear fell on my face because you know it's not every day when you have an offensive security and attacker and hackers talk about reporting uh, to senior leadership through a risk register, documenting the risk, looking at the control, working with your second line, those are familiar with the three lines of defense model, first line operational, second line risk and oversight, and then third, your audit friends, right? Printed audit, right? So, 
you know, it's interesting, right? So more and more, there's, there's more and more information, more and more, you know, awareness out there that you have to work with those areas and those lines of business to, you know, reduce the threat, understand the risk, and basically, you know, better your risk posture and better your control environment. So that was a, 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 a come to Jesus moment for me because obviously I've been in this space, I've been operational, I've been an offensive person, I've been the firewall guy, you know, just one person. I remember I ran a security team, it was just myself for three years. Uh, so the firewall guy, the GRC guy, the defensive guy, you name it, I did it, right? So having those different things in place and having those that team effort is going to get you to a really good place. So understanding the nuances of what the red team does, the blue team, and your GRC. Controlling, monitoring, you name it, right? That's all part of it. Um, to talk, to go down to materiality, right? This is a, a, a materiality rule I got from a, you know, really, really important uh, source, CISO that's out there that, that you know, has a lot of, uh, you know, me and a lot of uh, experience in this. You want to look at the, the, the brand, right? Reputational damage is huge. Uh, focus on protecting others. The way I see it, you want to look at it at three levels, right? You know, what's going to be catastrophic? If something were to happen, what's going to, you know, complete things out of, out of, the, out of the loop? You know, shut, that, shut it down for good. And then take it to the next level, right? Uh, you know, is it something that's going to really hurt us, but we will survive, we'll, we'll still continue. And then all the low hanging fruit, everything else, right? So focusing from that perspective, you have the availability, confidentiality, integrity. We all heard the CIA triad, but put it in a materiality terms and risk, what's going to impact your uh, reputation, what's going to impact your, your governance, your risk, your management, because that's what you know, leadership and what, that's what regulators want to see, right? So it's a different way of seeing the CIA triad as an example, but different ways to actually acknowledge that and have that com uh, commensurate assistance for all the areas and what actually what's going to get to, you know, hopefully get the CEO and everyone to approve and get on board because, you know, NYDFS, one of the new requirements is not only the CISO signs off, but then the CEO has to sign off. I mean, it's a double thing. They put their name to that, right? So there's something that happened and we all see what happened with the SolarWinds CEO, right? Uh, and that situation that's happening. Uh, so it's really important, right, to double down on the accountability and the transparency. And that nine box of cybersecurity materiality is going to kind of help you understand from a brand perspective, from a reputational perspective, what's going to be most important for those areas to really, you know, lock down and keep those things in. If you find what's materially important to you, the advantageous materiality, you're going to probably find the bad things that are actually happening too as well from the materiality perspective. So go after the good, to, you find the bad and vice versa. Regulatory workflow, right? Never set it and forget it. You know, it's, it's not as easy as just, you know, doing it once and that's it. It's continuous, right? It's a continuous life cycle. Having those influences, what regulations are, are calling on your bucket? You might work with HIPAA, you might work with PCI, you might work with GOBA, your financial institutions. If you're state government, tax tool too, right? I was in state government, I understand what that is. Uh, so the, the, depending on those influences and those regulations, you start looking at the controls that are applicable to those areas and how you can actually con consolidate, condense them, and what's basically applicable to you. Not all the controls are gonna be applicable to you. What's gonna be applicable to you, hold, hold, uh, how it goes in, whether it's a GRC platform or just you know good old spreadsheets. I mean, obviously you want to be automated. We live in 2024. There's really no reason why we should be relying on spreadsheets over spreadsheets over spreadsheets on controls and you know governing risk compliance efforts. Uh, but yeah, so that kind of shows the the path of operational execution and be defined, be prescriptive. Are you going to be doing something quarterly? Are you going to be doing something monthly? Just don't say uh, you know could be doing it at this point, should be doing it at this point. Be more precise on the timing, right? And the mitigation uh, protocols and risk management, evidence collection, continuous improvement. That's a continuous cycle. It's a vicious cycle because ultimately you have this assessment happening this, and then you have another team asking for this information for another assessment. So it really compounds, and I can see the, the, the burn for the teams, right, as they're getting more and more asked about different regulatory uh, assessments and, you know, engagements. And it's really good to kind of have that consolidated to make your life easier as, you know, offensive and security, security practitioners. Um, NIFCSF 2.0, show of hands, who's, uh, who's heard of the NIFCSF 2.0, awesome, right? So NIFCSF is obviously not to be prescriptive for you to know what you're doing, but it's really good to actually have the foundation for the protocols. It really, literally says it's guidance, right? It's not actually a regulatory mandate. Re used by any organization regardless of its size, right? Whether you're a small, medium, or a large organization, you use it, right? Based on the maturity, the CSF is not going to tell you how to prescribe those outcomes. They do have uh, implementation tiers this year, or for a for CSF 2.0 to really make a, a really good use case for leadership to understand how you can apply the CSF and those controls around that. But it's just a really good foundational uh, start to having really good cybersecurity risk uh, management uh, posture and risk management, uh, you know, evading of threats and vulnerabilities that are out there. 
Uh, privacy, right? We can't be talking about security and regulations if it's not about privacy as well, right? So the USA is going to get its own thing too, right? Uh, you know, there's happenings in Congress, happenings in, in you know, and uh, those levels of government to look at, you know, patchworks of different state uh, laws that are happening. We all heard CCPA, uh, California, CPRA, right? All these other states are, you know, kind of working in their own privacy legislation, but ultimately it comes down to, you know, are we going to have a unified law for the United States in privacy terms, and what's actually going to, what actually that means, right? They're going to be looking at data minimization, covered algorithms, data purposefulness, having actually a data, pri data privacy officer, like an actual leader accountable for data privacy and privacy efforts, right? And then obviously with targeted advertising, security of data. And then AI, right, the AI, the, the whole AI, you know, monster that's there happening, how that's going to impact privacy, that's going to impact the, the actual workflow of those environments, right? So think about that. It's understandable that it's really important to understand what's being applicable to you, but keep that in mind that that more regulation might be coming down the line in regards to privacy. Um, so why should I care? Well, the hammer's dropping, right? Look at all those, uh, you know, functions of, uh, you know, GDPR, you know, Amazon gave up, it might be a drop in the bucket, right? Because they make a million, a billion dollars a minute based on sales, right? But, you know, you know, a lot of organizations do not have those funds and don't have the amount of revenue and equity to, you know, deal with these sorts of, you know, fines and penalties, right? So, uh, you know, commission filed 784 enforcements, obtained orders for nearly $5 billion in financial remedies, and distributed nearly a billion dollars to farm investors. That's a lot of money. Uh, so ultimately the hammer is coming, it's dropping, more and more you start seeing that, and a lot of organizations kind of like waiting, they're taking a wait and see approach of how someone's gonna get ding and how, why they get ding and what can do to prevent that from happening to us, right? Uh, but you don't wanna be that person that gets dinged first and then having that out there for everyone to kind of replicate what not to do and what you did wrong, right? So all these, I'm not gonna go down the line, right? But you know, all these are companies that you heard of. Uh, I, I know you all got in some, uh, I know, did anyone get the AT&T letter? about the uh, disclosure of breach, I got that one. I'm sure you probably got T-Mobile. I mean, it's unfortunate, right? And, you know, our data's out there, uh, and that's, that's, that's bad, it's not good. Compliance is always different for everyone, right? So, you know, based on what's applicable to you, the influences, the regulations that are applicable to your environment, to your, to your structure, that's how you're gonna know what actually is important to you from that perspective, right? So, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but you know, a lawyer will tell you, you need to document, right? If it didn't, if you don't document, it didn't happen. That's first and foremost, that's the, that's the law of the land. So documenting and having those targets, you know, having that one year, the, the now, you know, near future sort of approach, right? Understanding the strategic goals, the roadmaps, right? Because obviously the regulators want to see how your information security program is now, what it's, what it's the outlook in the future for a three, five year perspective, and actually what you're working on to deal with some of the different things you've called out yourself, right? Your auditor is going to call out findings, they're going to call out different situations that you need to work on. So keep that in mind based on the industry, based on your revenue, based on your allocation of resources. Let's face it, you know, usually teams don't get resources until you get popped, right? Until you get big, uh, and that's unfortunate. But you want to be making the case that, you know, obviously information security is a cost center, it's not a cost revenue generator. So, okay, we're going to save yourselves all this money, how can we do that? You show them that, right? Uh, and, and ultimately, you know, worst case scenario, catastrophic events. You know, you want to do do them in gloom either, right? But you want to be realistic and set those realistic expectations with those teams as they're doing that sort of work. So the compliance is the game plan for everyone, right? Did I just not predict myself? Because I just said it was based on your board, based on your vertical, right? But there's different things that everyone can do, right? Inventory. I talked about risk risk management inventories. Identify all your key stakeholders all the risk standards, all the reviews pertinent to your uh, existing policies, uh, procedures. You know, GRC is a really big deal. Having policies, having standards, having SOPs, whatever it is you do, make sure it's, you know, done the right way, documented the right way, you know, implemented the right way in a GRC platform, mm -hmm. or like I mentioned, spreadsheets, if you don't have those flexibilities to use a service now in Archer, uh, those are familiar with those, uh, you know, platforms. And then crown jewels, what's gonna be most important for that organization to protect? What's the crown jewels, right? Asset, the visi uh, asset visibility gaps, right? Control gaps in those areas of what you're protecting from that perspective. Operationalized, right? Cybersecurity awareness training. The number one thing that all these regulations have is what? Everyone has to have a cybersecurity awareness training program. That's first and foremost, that's baseline now. Um, so they see that you have a cybersecurity pro program, you're not doing phishing tests on the, on the network, on the environment, they're gonna thank you for that. That's gonna be a big deal because basically ultimately the end user, which is people, up, you know, working for that organization, they're not getting that cybersecurity hygiene, they're not getting their awareness, hence you're gonna have issues and then come back to that. Really it's like basically, you know, 
it's like you have an accidental insurance where you get in the car wreck and you know you, you you're basically responsible and it was your fault. Uh, racing, uh, you know, races are huge, right? Having a responsibility matrix to understand who's accountable, who's going to be informed, who needs to do all these things on you know from a you know cybersecurity posture, regardless of the URC team, you're in the fireball team, PKI team, everyone needs to understand what their role is and how it actually pertains to the bigger picture of things, right? So reporting cadence, how you're gonna have that reporting cadences to your to your leaders and leadership. And then next step, always implementing implementing the new cyber risk processes to be fully compliant with the regulatory obligation. So that's why you work with the legal team, with your compliance folks to say, okay, are we meeting these things? How are we meeting that? We're gonna ask for proof. And don't think of it as an audit, because everyone has audit as like, you know, it's a bad day and you know they're gonna, they're gonna come back and get us. Uh, you know, don't be that, don't have that confrontational relationship. Easier said than done, right, depending on how the auditors, uh, you know, conduct themselves and work. But ultimately, we're all working for the same organization. So if we're going to lose funding or we're going to get dinged, their teams are also going to get dinged, and then you're going to have issues with funding. You might have layoffs. I mean, a lot of things are happening in the tech industry right now based on different things that the company's the bottom line, right? Ultimately, what's going to get them to save their money and be operational. So material and governance. Who decides what's material? What do you all think? Is it the CEO? Is it the CFO? Is it the general counsel? Is it the CIO? Is it the board? What do y'all think? The board? The auditors. All of them. Legal, right? Your lawyers, right? <laughs> they should reign always. In my honest opinion, everyone else has input, right? So legal has to make that call. I've seen so many different times when legal and you know the cyber team say, oh, we had an incident and we have a breach. If legal doesn't tell you to say that, you don't say that, right? Uh, because you get into this whole you know, song and dance of like, why are we calling it an incident when legal and the team just, uh, organization decided that it wasn't an incident? So always revert to legal and always make sure they understand that everyone's on the same page, but the call has to come from them and it cascades down to everyone, right? And you start with what's already known, what's material, right? Read your financial reports if you have those. Talk to everyone. Material curiosity. No one's actually discussed that. That's a new term that I heard it in, uh, in, in you know, different webinars and webcasts. Uh, hook into the corporate teams, right? If they have business line departments, uh, tech MBRs, is any sort of MBR like a, you know, a business, a master business record? They kind of get together quarterly basis. Uh, they review different things that are happening in the organization. If you're plugged into all those things, you're probably going to have a better idea of what's material, what's going to be more important for the organization to hook at it, right? And then work with your second line. If you have enterprise risk management teams in place, and then don't forget our audit friends. Audit's also going to be important. Understand the audit plan, the coverage, what's, what's in role, what's in plan for coverage 2024, 2025, what audits are going to get up. Be, you be ready, be upfront, and you have more information to be honest and transparent. Here, here it is, what do we do to get better? And that's the really type of relationship you want with your audit teams. So aren't you glad you live in Texas? Right, look at all these rules, right? Youth the Consumer Privacy Act, Colorado Data Privacy Act, obviously we know uh, GDPR, uh, CCPA, uh, Connecticut, right? Well, guess what? I spoke too soon, right? Starting in July of 2024, Texas is going to get their own privacy legislation, right? Enacted, enabled. Uh, it's called the TDPSA. Did anyone know that? Show of hands. Right. So be ready for that, right? It's going to be something like I mentioned, cluster, you know, cluster fudge of different organizations, different states are going to be looking at privacy and how that's actually going to happen and have an impact on us, right? Uh, so that's a good, that's that's really one to look at. And then obviously the United States is doing maybe a, a, a national one. We, we need to be aware of that, right? So, you know, it's, it's coming, right? So, you know, be ready, be understanding what compliance can help uh, and understanding the rule, the regulations, how it's gonna impact our business, right? From a consumer perspective, even for us as consumers, as we buy stuff, I mean, we all see those little banners, privacy notices here, click accept all, cookies, all that nice stuff. It's gonna probably get a little bit more robust as here as we live in Texas, even where, you know, our, you know, uh, mom and pop shops too, because they have to adhere to this privacy legislation once it's enacted. So ultimately, you want to have an out tangible outcome, right? If you want to be the man, you're going to pay the man, right? So you know, let's do a little example, right? Um, state agency uses three influences. Let's say they use NIST CSF 2.0, the 853 control family. Show of hands, is anyone familiar with that? Okay, and TAC tool two. So basically, give or take, it's around 2,000 controls that you're looking at, right? So let's say, let, let's say you have a, a, an assessment happening, right? So you have two resources, they work four weeks at 320 hours, just some checking in, influence, and document updates, right? And then updating the documents, that's another 320 hours for those same resources. And then you look at the controls, you gather that evidence, you can go down the line, right? So it starts building up, right? Literally, you have 2,560 hours of fully loaded work, and they say they're charging $120 an hour. And that's 
that baseline, and that can be frugal, right? Because, I mean, your big four, your KPPs, your EYs, they're probably going to charge a lot more than that, right? Uh, and that's modest, right? But if you really hone in and see what controls are really applicable to you, you can literally reduce them by half, depending on what influences you have. You just save yourself half of that 307k as an example, as a total cost, right? So you save some money, right? Compliance paid off. It's sexy, right? They always think compliance is not sexy. Here, it's not sexy. Well, in this case, you save money, right? I think that's you know doesn't get any more sexier than that. So just an example, right? Obviously, those in financial services, those numbers you can multiply and tenfold, right? Based on all the different things that are happening from a cost perspective. But it shows that if you know how to do what you're doing, you're gonna save money, right? You might not make the company money, but at least save the money and understand your control uh, effectiveness. And maybe have, have more resources to up on other things, right? Not necessarily focus on an assessment at one point given time. So keep that in mind. Somebody, uh, I've been teaching, right? I've been teaching tax security since 2012 to have my master's. And then one of my students this past year told me, well, there's never an emergency in DRC. And I started thinking, I'm like, yeah, you're right. And then I saw this and like I had to backtrack. I said, now I don't believe that so much, right? Because security controls can kill. New research finds that hospitals experience data breach. We all seen that, right, with you. And she, uh, data breach that just happened. The death rate among heart attack patients increased in the months and years afterward. The increased mortality rate doesn't appear to be due to the perpetrators themselves. The hackers aren't controlling the allocation of medication or doctors. Rather, the issue may lie, may lie how with the healthcare systems adjust to cyber security after an attack, according to a study. So that's pretty big. So it's not, I mean, the hackers are going to get what they want. They want the money. But ultimately, you know, collateral damage is people dying on, 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 you know, in hospitals. And that's that literally, those controls kill people at that point in time, if you think about it, right? So the issue may lie with how healthcare organizations deal with cyber security. So now it gets real. Now there's actually a tangible thing that, you know, I mean, I want to go to a hospital, I don't want to die because someone didn't do their due diligence in how they handle the control environment, cyber security posture, and all those things, right? So after data breaches, as many as 36 additional deaths per 10,000 heart attacks occurred annually at the hundreds uh, of hospitals examined in the new study. Heart attacks rank, rank among the most medical emergencies in the U.S. So think about it. I mean, that's 36 different people that died because of some, you know, bad cybersecurity posture, cyber hygiene, whatever you want to call it, and bad controls, right, from a cybersecurity perspective. That's horrible. I mean, you know, that's horrible. And we've seen this, uh, I've seen things in the news when they have ransomware attacks at hospitals, you know, that, you know, they make the attribution to people dying because of that ransomware attack because systems were not up online, you know, there's no life support available based on that system being down to a ransomware attack, as an example. So keep that in mind. Cybersecurity remediation and hospitals appear to be slowing down. Doctors, nurses, and other health professionals as they offer emergency cardiac care. So, you know, they have to, they're honest with that, but they understand why it is that they're doing what they're doing. So, statistics with regulatory impact, right? So, 76% have felt some sort of pressure to dilute the reality of security risk, right? I mean, so leaders are pressured to kind of, you know, make it seem like it's not really that big of a deal. That's a big, big percentage, right? The NSAD found that 61% of corporate Directors will compromise on information security for the sake of a business objective. That's a problem because they want to be innovative. They want to, you know, uh, you know, uh, turn to market. They want to do something that's going to get them more money, but at the expense of cybersecurity. So that's a lot. That's a lot of people. ISACA reported that 84% of business leaders were confident in their security posture. Only 31% security staff had confidence. We saw that with SolarWinds, right? Even their own SolarWinds people were, you know, coming back and saying that their cybersecurity had holes, like actually. Swiss cheese or grilled cheese or something, that's what they said in the finding, right? So if the leaders are saying one thing and the people on the ground are saying another thing, that's a big problem, right? As I mentioned, you have to really be on the same page and if you're not, you're gonna have issues. Form, we all know what happened with the former Uber, uh, Uber security chief found guilty of continuing the data breach. The SEC adopting the cybersecurity risk and management strategy government disclosure rule of July, 2023. And then the SEC, we all know what happened with SolarWinds, they sued the, uh, the CISO and CEO for disclosure of control failures uh, in their environment, right? That happened in October of 2023. So it sounds cliche, as I've heard this, people process technology, I think, you know, we probably, you know, those that are in this field probably seen this a million times over and we're just, you know, it just, it's cliche, but it really is, it really does come down to hammering down on people processing technology, right? Understanding those three areas, understanding what risk, what cybersecurity materiality events can come out of those three different areas, and understanding that, right? So it sounds cliche, but it really is what we have. Um, so like I mentioned, always take a breath, think and act, right? Think about the cat catastrophic event level, what's gonna, you know, completely take it out, wipe us out. Uh, always, you know, understanding what could kill us, the extinction level event, and then everything under that, right? You know, what can really hurt us from a reputational perspective, but we're still, we're still gonna survive that, right? And those controls and how do you deal with that? 
if you put yourself in that mindset, you're probably going to be a better, you know, uh, have more reactive and better proactive approaches to dealing with cybersecurity risk management as a whole. So what can you do? What you should do? Has anyone heard of BLUS? <coughs> Army folks in the house, right? Bottom line up front. I'm ex-USA, so that's why I learned that one. Uh, material assessment uh, can and should inform both reporting risks, largely looking backward, right? And your strategy, looking forward, uh, to manage and mitigate the risk. Where to start? Start with the business, the financial statements, like I mentioned. Uh, like I mentioned, find the material benefit. What's really important for the organization? It will lead to material risk. The good will lead you to the bad and understand how you protect those things from happening. Focus on how an information asset can be compromised. Look for direct and indirect relationships that could cause exposures, right? Go beyond the attack surface and look at attack depth that exists, attack and depth, surfacing, you know, uh, defense and depth, that sort of approach. And then shift to exposure management versus vulnerability management, right? Prioritize, prioritize, prioritize. Automate, automate, automate whenever possible, right? Otherwise, you, your time to contextualize will take too long and the complexity will be too great. It sounds easier said than done, but that's the things that we have to look at and do. From, a, you know, from that cybersecurity risk management perspective and addressing regulatory uh, oversight and uh, uh, addressing regulatory issues. So at the, end, at the end of the day, you want to ask yourself these questions, right? How do you manage cyber risk? Your come to Jesus moment, go with Jesus, right? Is it enough? How do you know? Like, how do you know when it's enough? How do you know, right? And then I answer everything with honesty. Was it driven by the data, right? One thing is to say one thing, right, uh, like I mentioned. But if the data says those things that you're saying and it's aligned, the data speaks to that, you're probably going to be in a better spot. If the data is saying it's pretty bad, you might want to work on that and fix those things, right? Because ultimately the data is going to come back and bite you. Because especially if you tell a completely different story that's not aligned and corollary and correlating with the data. Um, this one's a big old slide, right? But I mean, I just wanted to drop that in there at the very end. Uh, so significant er efforts are happening, right? I mean, you see that. You see, obviously, we've seen that little meme, right? Everything's fine. You're on fire. Looking at you know uh, the forensic incident response, understand the reporting. Organizations may need to report incidents while still investigating them. Especially if you have four business takes to report it, you're you're probably going to be dealing with the bridge and incident at that point in time. It's not going to be oh we're just going to report something after the fact. No, you're doing it at that time in flight. So look at addressing the asset. Like I mentioned, I'm going to double down on asset avenues, re revenues, asset management. 100% know that know what's happening in your environment. Have qualitative risk assessments, have quantitative risk assessments, have hybrid risk assessments. Reputational risk, I mean, a lot of people don't even include reputational risk in their risk posture, risk environment, risk profile. Um, you know, and if you don't have those, you're gonna basically have a blind spot in regulatory reporting from a risk perspective as well. So, you know, so basically the gap between that regulatory reporting, your IT teams, maturity impact, helping those financial impacts and working those together. If you're publicly traded, you have to have all your financial disclosures, all your financial uh, statements in play, how they're aligning to the cybersecurity program, how they're aligning to the InfoSec program, how they're working together, that's one thing, right? And then, like I mentioned, the number one denominator on all the regulations that are happening in the world right now is cybersecurity training. If you're not training your folks in cybersecurity, you're doing it wrong, you're basically starting on the wrong foot, and you're probably gonna have a lot more issues, uh, you know, probably sooner rather than later, so keep that in mind. So, those that went to the, anyone, uh, this is Mr. Rob Dodson's tabletop exercise. Awesome, right? Tabletop, how do you engage that? You tabletop the hell out of it, right? Look at that, uh, you know, supply chain attack, which is, which is covered on the last presentation. Uh, look at that scenario, I'm not gonna go into it word for word, but look at all the questions that you're asking yourself, right? Who's gonna be responsible to handle it, right? If your internal team, if your corporate networks are down, how are you gonna be able to communicate with each other, right? How would you evaluate the materiality of the component and impact in that sort of company A, uh, situation where they have an irregularities in the work, in the software patches, right? And how that organization is dealing with the supply chain attack, right? So, you know, you start thinking about, you're not gonna do it until you put yourself in a situation that how would you do it? Like, don't wait for it to happen. Be proactive and do a tabletop, right? Understanding what the, the situation is. If you have a lot of cyber supply chain, um, you, know, uh, you know, vendors you work with, you might wanna do a tabletop around this specific uh, area, if that makes sense. Too close to home, this one's interesting, right? So this one did happen in real life, so we'll get, in, we'll get into it. So IOCs, right, patient zero was the CEO, right? It's basically the CEO's son, somebody took a picture of got an email from his girlfriend, and that picture was weaponized, right? And it was actually a real picture of his kid, and understanding how that input, so it actually went from the house to the business, right? So do you have an answer response plan that specifically details attack on C-suite, on your leadership structure, right? on their home systems, because ultimately that came from a picture from an email from home 
of their son, right? And that, that picture had weaponized and obviously infiltrated into the networks and at work. And understanding that actually takes a uh, cost of fire and incident response had to come in and DFIR and all your stuff happened, right? So how would you handle a whole compromise that leads into the organization compromise? How do you ev evaluate materiality in that instance, right? Who makes that call? I mean, because ultimately you're getting to more, you know, more, uh, that's where legal needs to get involved, right? To understand it's a CEO that got hacked. You know, we have to, you know, address the report appropriately, probably get his own machine, take it off the network and inspect it, do forensics analysis on it. Uh, you know, that's probably what I would do. Uh, but it's the perfect fish, right? Because the fish came from a, re a reputable source, his girlfriend, with a weaponized, you know, probably stenography attack on that picture file of his child, right? So it's not something that he clicked on that would look weird or anything like that. It's not the normal fish, it's a perfect fish. So uh, more and more situations are happening. Uh, there's a lot of companies like Black Cloak out there that have that have uh, handle C-suite leadership security uh, and high-profile like you know your your, uh, your celebrities and things like that. They look at these perfect fish scenarios all the time and they cycle through them. Uh, so, but those in enterprise and you know more organizations that don't really realize that's actually an avenue for an attack and something that we, we might wanna, we might want to realize and keep them to account. So last but not least, this just happened two days ago. I took the, uh, Matthew Olson reported that on LinkedIn. So the Assistant Attorney General for National Security stated at the Wall Street Journal's Tech Live, which happened a couple days ago. Cybersecurity conference at a number of occasions, the Justice Department has delayed company's disclosure because making the attacks public will create substantial risk and raise national security concerns. So there's a few caveats to reporting uh, SEC materiality disclosures for cybersecurity disclosures. One of, the, one of those is if it causes, you know, uh, you know National, uh, you know, great national concern, or it can be a national incident. They might have to delay the disclosure of that. But is anyone surprised? So now a lot of organizations might be getting hacked, but we might not know about it if you're a publicly, you know, uh, traded company. If you're an investor of that organization, basically because it was supposed to be a national security threat, hence they're not reporting. They delay the reporting. That's a big deal, and that just happened a couple of days ago. And I'm and I'm probably getting, you know, probably getting to see, and not surprised to see that you're going to see a lot more of that, right? Uh, what, you know, what's the whole point of doing all this and reporting if a lot of people are not reporting and kind of throwing it under the under the under the bus, basically based on you know, oh, it's national security, it's going to impact the national security. It's really important. And then once they do disclose that, how what's the what's going to be the the effects of that? What's going to be the repercussions of waiting a certain amount of time of not disclosing those cybersecurity incidents? So it's just something to keep in mind, right? So we really don't think those things about. When we're talking about cybersecurity regulation, whether it's NYDFS, SEC, HIPAA, GOBA, you name it. Uh, so it's just one of those things that are happening in the environment. Uh, and with that, thank you for my presentation. Uh, <laughs> questions? No questions? <laughs> um, I know I covered a lot. Yes, sir. Can you talk about uh, post ransomware attack hospitals? like? Is that because systems are down or unavailable to the staff? I just don't know a lot about this, and I'm curious like, why that happens. Uh, you get around with health director of a hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to go home crying when I was there. Mm -hmm. uh, literally, their asset inventory was not there. So literally, I had to create a script, get a scanner, and go around each and every meeting hall at the hospital, scanning each and every standpoint, either the tank line or whatever it is, to make sure we have visibility, right? First and foremost. From there, we get a whole scale of risk assessment and what that data is, what those systems can tell. And I'm guessing those hospitals didn't have any other, right? So, to your question, hypothetically, there's a ransomware, you know, probably the after after action item of you know, how much they were down, how long it took them to come back up, it's probably going to be the number one driver. Uh, if people were to have those situations that they need to be interdicted somewhere else, the systems are not working, and you know, have their lives at risk. So, that's a really good question. But yeah, I mean, from a hospital setting perspective, that's probably one of the on a black yep. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Hey, this is really US centric. Uh, uh, yes. Um, I've been assuming that many of us work in multinational corporations. Yes. So, what are your thoughts on uh, compliance with uh, 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 regulations outside the US? I mean, obviously, know them, right? Understanding working with me that understands their regulation, ISO 2700. I mean, I, I stood up ISO 2700, ISMS programs. Uh, and obviously, from a privacy perspective, GDPR, the EU rule, uh, and then more and more uh, in cybersecurity uh, is happening on that side of the world, right? So understanding what those things are, how they apply to those, you know, entities, right? Because a lot, a lot of us have entity types or field types, or we have field 
few members that are outside the, the U.S. Uh, normal reporting protocols. So I'll probably say that, do a risk assessment of all your regulatory compliance, you know, avenues that have impact to your teams, and then look at to see how it aligns with actually what's happening on the U.S. side. We have a U.S. headquarters, as an example. Uh, but yes, I mean, obviously this is more U.S. centric, but compliance is here in China, right? And security is here in China, so the same thing. Make sure you apply the right control based on the environment that you're in. Thank you. I have a quick question. Yes, ma'am. So, I think one of the biggest issues in the ICC is lack of data. Data coming up from the wrong floor, the ones that are most likely to see the issue. From the first line, yes. Yeah. And trying to encourage them that nothing is too small and having processes uh, that allow for them to report that up and not feeling like they did something wrong or incidents are not bad. You know, they are rather than have Security awareness so, training reporting, right? The reporting yeah. aspect of the huge. So what have you seen in terms of best practices? How do you incentivize the to feel like And I've seen, you know, basically from the outside security awareness training tournament, we, at my company we have something called Report the Fish. We have a cyber Y score, like an actual scorecard that kind of, kind of like a competition between teams to see who's going to have the best cyber security posture within the life of businesses. So make it a little bit more gamified, as if you can. Uh, you know, they get, uh, they get Bravo points. I guess it's an internal method to, you know, you know, provide, you know, uh, get things from the merch store as an example. Like have some sort of incentives for teams to report different things and call out different things. Uh, organizations do it differently, but ultimately it comes out to the reporting training as a whole and understanding reporting those small things because something might be small, like it can snowball off something material, or it can be something benign that really is a bad thing happening that would probably cause a big breach, right? So it all comes down to the education. It all comes down to the awareness. Thank you. Any more questions? All right, well, thank you. Appreciate it.